Welcome back to Viewpoint. Thank you to Michael Beltran and also to Alan Guerrero for their coverage of the opening of the new Galpe House. We now turn our attention to Bitcoin. The cryptocurrency is the first decentralized digital currency designed to work without a central bank. But the technology that underpins it continues to create a buzz and is emerging as a potentially important area of business for Gibraltar, as Rosa Stengo now reports. Distributed ledger technology is making a huge impact in financial services all over the world. It's generated a multi-billion dollar wave of investment in blockchain technology and business startups and it's enabled the growth of over a thousand cryptocurrencies. But DLT has moved beyond that as it's become more and more apparent that its range of potential applications seems to be almost limitless. A distributed ledger is a type of database that exists on multiple computers at the same time in a network. Unlike a traditional ledger that's controlled by a single source, a distributed ledger is validated and updated by those using it from various locations. All users have identical copies and any changes to the database are reflected virtually simultaneously across the network. The result is a decentralized system of data registry where transactions are instant, transparent, reliable and immutable. Blockchain is a type of distributed ledger. Here data is grouped together and organized in blocks which are then linked to one another and secured using cryptography. The information stored within the blocks are accessible using private or public keys and provides the framework for digital currencies like Bitcoin. In fact, blockchain was developed by Bitcoin's creator, Satoshi Nakamoto. So why is blockchain important and how has it evolved and grown since the early days of Bitcoin? The Token Market Summit recently brought cryptocurrency and blockchain experts, innovators, investors and thought leaders to the rock. I caught up with investor and author of the business blockchain, William Mugiar, to ask him that very question. Thank you very much, Rensu, Minister, for inviting me here. I've always wanted to come to Gibraltar. Uh, last year, we drove by it a couple of times and we looked at the market. Said, so the blockchain is a very disruptive technology, and it is disrupting the financial intermediary. And as you know, financial intermediaries and financial institutions are all over in our current world. So there is a lot of friction right now when you try to disrupt what has been going on for a number of years. But in reality, you have to think about the blockchain as this new emerging world. It is a new financial system that is being created in front of our very eyes as a parallel one to the traditional one. So where are we today? We're in the very early stages of maybe another 20 years. We are maybe where the web was in 95, 96 or 97. Well, you talk about friction and there is some resistance from the more traditional financial institutions to embrace blockchain. Do you see a world in the future where both economies will work together in parallel or is it one or the other? In the long term, they will work together, but we should not really count on that to be the propeller that moves it forward. I remember back in the web days, in the early days, Putting a credit card on the web was not considered to be very secure and the banks did not want to touch it. And today we do this without even thinking about it. Today, every time you try to compare the blockchain financial world that is emerging to the traditional world, there is going to be a lot of friction is going back and forth between one or the other. But if you are staying in the blockchain world, there's so much efficiency out there. It's a promise of a more efficient, more cost-effective, more secure and faster way of doing transactions between consumers and between consumers and businesses. And that is really why this is so exciting. So what is the blockchain? What does it do? Why are we doing this differently? That is what we have to keep remembering. And There's been a huge uptake of blockchain with fintech companies and startups. But what about those global traditional organizations? What's been the uptake rate among them. The sad reality is that the blockchain and the financial world that is being built behind it 
do not need the existing incumbents and the existing financial players, but they need the blockchain. Initially, they said, well, we may need the blockchain, but we don't need the cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency, which is an important application of the blockchain, is a threatening type of event for the banks, for governments, and right now, they think that they just like to use the distributed ledger technology of the blockchain, which is about validating transactions. But the real innovation here is that we now have the ability to create new currencies, and not just one currency like Bitcoin or Ethereum, but we can have thousands and thousands of cryptocurrencies, which are also called tokens, because tokens are the new business models enablers of the blockchain economy. Some of the more skeptical traditional financial institutions might be smiling today when they look at the value of Bitcoin. It's under $7,000, considerably lower uh, since the end of last year. Would you say it's a victory for them? Not necessarily. We should not just look at the price of Bitcoin as an indicator of what is going on in the marketplace. The fundamentals of the blockchain and the fundamentals of cryptocurrency are very, very strong. The problem and the challenge that big companies have is that they are tied in by their existing business model. Everything ties back to what they are currently doing. So for them, they are not going to disrupt themselves. They may want to change things a little bit, but not a whole lot. And the blockchain is about a lot of change. And that is why they are resisting it. And that is why change will come in slower doses from the big companies. You have to look at the startups, at the small companies. They are the ones that are innovating the most. And they are the ones that will give us the next Googles, the next Facebooks, the next LinkedIn, the next big companies uh, of the blockchain have not been perhaps not born yet. A million smart contracts are being used. This is like real activity on the blockchain. What about regulations? Can you give us an overview of what other countries and jurisdictions are doing and how does that compare with Gibraltar, the work that's been done here? The challenge with the blockchain is that it is a global phenomenon and it does not know borders. It cuts across boundaries. And the challenge for the regulators is that they specifically are used to working in local jurisdictions. And right now there are four spheres that are happening t today. The four spheres of blockchain regulation are North America, Europe, Asia, and the alternative uh, jurisdictions. And Gibraltar is a very strong player in the alternative jurisdictions marketplace of blockchain regulation. And actually Gibraltar, in my opinion, is punching above their weight in being very innovative. Most of the other Western regulators, they have the same problem as big companies do, which is that they cannot change too quickly. They like to keep their old ways and regulate everything the way they have been regulating things for the last 70 years. But the innovation is coming from new jurisdictions like Gibraltar, who is willing to make changes, who is willing to innovate, to create new regulation that is more in line with what the technology allows us to do. And that way they can attract more companies and more investments into Gibraltar. So I'm very excited about seeing this here. When I travel around the world to talk about the blockchain and interact with a lot of uh, market players and the consumers at large, they see Gibraltar as a, an entity that is being innovative and uh, very intriguing to them. And it has been very easy to do business with Gibraltar. When I talk to startups, and many times I ask them, where are they uh, trying to do their fundraising? And Gibraltar comes up many times and it is always uh, this image of friendliness, of being open for business and being easy to do business with, which is very good. The token market cap at the moment stands at around $250 billion. Do you see a world one day when one of the cryptocurrencies will become a global currency? Definitely, there will not just be one global currency with the cryptocurrency world. Of course, Bitcoin today is the dominant one, Ethereum is the second one. There may be hundreds of them and every application will have its own cryptocurrency. It is a new world in the same way that we are used to uh, using applications today on our smartphone and typically we may gravitate towards six or seven or eight of them that we use on a daily basis. There will be a handful of cryptocurrencies that we will use on a daily basis because they will relate to some kind of work that we are doing, some kind of function. There will be industry specific uh, tokens. There will be specific usage cryptocurrencies that you can use for one particular purpose. And there will be others that will be global that will be interchangeable. So this is a new world out there and we should be very ready for it.
Satoshi Nakamoto is the name used by Bitcoin's creator, but his or her or their true identity has never been officially confirmed. And the last known correspondence from him was some seven years ago. But some claim to know who he really is, such as monetary economist and founder of the Bitcoin Foundation, John Matonis, recently on The Rock for the Token Market Summit. John Matonis is one of the few people to have had direct email contact with Satoshi. Go possibly migrate to decentralized. My first involvement with uh, Bitcoin was through my digital currency blog. So I had had a blog uh, on general digital currency since 2008. Um, I published an article on Bitcoin, uh, several articles on Bitcoin in, in 2009, 2010. Uh, and then I received an email from Satoshi in early 2010 uh, encouraging me to. Um, uh, get more into mining, get more into investigating the properties of the system, get more into marketing and promoting Bitcoin. Um, and uh, we continued an exchange of emails uh, for a few weeks, um, and that's when I really started to become involved. You were one of the founding directors of the Bitcoin Foundation, along with some legendary figures now, Gavin Anderson, Charlie Schrem. Um, when you look back at that time, you know, a lot of the resistance that you faced as well, a lot of the problems that were had, uh, what do you think? What, what are your thoughts about that, that time? We uh, put together the foundation in 2012, um, and we did it uh, first and foremost as a way to compensate the volunteer developers because if you go back to that time we only had volunteer coders working on the protocol they weren't getting paid by anyone we didn't want them to be paid by uh, maybe other governments that weren't so friendly to bitcoin so we were actually putting the foundation in place to be able to fund their work continue to fund their work which also enabled um, uh, enabled us to get a disclosure from them that they weren't being uh, funded in any other way. Uh, and at that time in Bitcoin in 2012, that was very important to the, to the community and to the protocol. Um, and we did get uh, a lot of the early names in Bitcoin. And people look back now that, uh, you know, two of uh, the, the founding board members had to resign. Uh, one uh, did uh, time in, in prison, which you mentioned, Charlie Schramm. And all of that was, uh, we had gotten the best uh, representatives from the best companies at the time in 2012. BitInstant was one of the uh, early Bitcoin companies. Mt. Gox, as you know, was one of the early earliest Bitcoin exchange. Uh, and we had uh, Mark Carpellis on our founding board, as well as Roger Vier. All the key names. Well, and at the time, they, they were the, the, the top of uh, the Bitcoin pyramid there. Now, yourself, Gavin, and others, of course, um, had direct correspondence with Satoshi. You have some very firm ideas as to the actual identity of Satoshi. Can you talk to us about that at all? Uh, well, an article came out in Medium uh, on my personal blog in 2016, uh, which I addressed that topic uh, in my article there. Um, and, and I still uh, stand by that article, so I have not retracted the article. Um, it's a very controversial topic in the community. Um, and I think that uh, the, the world will still be very surprised. Um, I'd like to ask you about um, Bitcoin's greatest year, 2017. Um, huge excitement about the digital currency and uh, I'm not going to say has the bubble burst because that has become such a cliche now, but we do see the value of Bitcoin has dropped dramatically. Can you just explain to us how did it grow? Why? What was the reason for it to have grown to uh, in the way that it did in 2017? And why is it now falling? What's happening in the world of Bitcoin? Right. For, first of all, I don't. Uh, whenever I hear people say that uh, Bitcoin is a bubble, I actually think the opposite. I think Bitcoin is the pin that pops the bubble. The the, the government uh, debt market and the equity markets are more the bubble that is being propped up. Uh, so think of Bitcoin as your as your savior in that. So we did see a run up. We saw a massive run up in 2017. Um, and markets tend to get ahead of themselves. Uh, markets tend to, uh, to, to, to reach the extremes. Uh, so we saw a run up to near $20,000 per Bitcoin. 
Uh, we, we've seen now a, a retracement that we're living through uh, of about 70%, which puts us at, uh, what is it, $5,800 US, 5900 Now, if we had gone in baby steps from 800 to 900 to 1000 to 2000 and got to 5800 now, people would be saying, you know, this is a, a glorious future. Uh, but that's not the way markets work. Markets uh, overreact on the extremes on both sides. Um, and you have to look at this, uh, first of all, you have to look at it in a logarithmic chart. Um, and you have to look at, at it over the uh, medium to long term. Is it a commodity or is it a currency? Uh, Bitcoin is a commodity. It's commodity crypto money. Um, and most governments define it that way for uh, tax purposes uh, in terms of capital gains and capital losses. Uh, but they also want to define it as a currency when that's convenient for them. So uh, they're, they're conflicted on the issue, <clears throat> but I think if, from an economic standpoint, um, uh, Bitcoin is commodity-based money, um, and it, uh, it, 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 it would operate and function um, similar to gold money in an economy. Uh, so Bitcoin is digital gold, uh, gold is analog Bitcoin. Bank of England Governor Mark Carney is, is talking again about the inherently risky nature of cryptocurrencies and he's giving out warnings and he talks about how it's connected with illicit activity. Those sort of adjectives seem to be forever connected with Bitcoins. What do you think about that whenever you hear people talking about Bitcoin in that way? Well, he's not the only one. Um, there are many. There's uh, uh, numerous Bitcoin obituaries that are posted all over the Internet. Uh, some of the other names that you see saying these viewpoints uh, come from uh, Warren Buffett, Warren Buffett's uh, new CEO, um, not new, but uh, Munger, uh, Paul Krugman, who's a mouthpiece for the fiat world in general. Uh, so you have people all over the world that are uh, describing Bitcoin in this way. And, and I tend to lump them together in um, what economists call the, the state theory of money. Um, the state theory of money was a theory uh, that was put forth by George Knapp in the early 20th century, saying that mo money receives its value only because it is uh, sanctioned by government as having value, and that's what, that's what gives it value, and that's what makes it money. It's the only true money. Um, and that theory is being challenged by the alternative viewpoint which is that money can evolve uh, spontaneously from the market um, and it doesn't have to derive its value from the state uh, and we don't need central banks to determine what our money is. So I think what most offends uh, people like Mark Carney is that we all know money is an illusion. I mean, you know, rectangular pieces of paper that have the picture of the queen on them, what, why are they worth money at all? I mean, in, in a real world, they wouldn't be worth anything. So we know money's an illusion. But where Mark uh, gets his feathers ruffled is they want to mandate the illusion from the top down. And what Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies do is uh, the people from the bottom up have said, uh, we're going to be in charge of our own illusion and we're going to give something else value that's not sanctioned and run by the government. So that they fear a decentralized money uh, where it's bottom up. And that, this is why it's so imperative for, uh, for people around the world to embrace Bitcoin. But there is also an issue about the untraceability of, of Bitcoin transactions. Um, and that is an issue, and that's being connected to the whole Silk Road um, illicit activity that Mark Carney talks about. Um, what would you say to those sorts of criticisms that it just makes that sort of black market activity easier? I would say that you should embrace those features. Uh, first of all, money doesn't have a morality. So uh, the, the pound and the euro and the dollar are used uh, on a far greater scale for illicit activity than any digital currency like, like Bitcoin. So uh, you know, he, he's a little bit confused in that. But if you look at paper cash, the paper cash that's in our wallets today, uh, we have those same properties. So paper cash has uh, user-defined privacy, it has minimal traceability, um, and it has irreversibility. So it's a bearer instrument. You can't reverse the transaction. So we have that with paper cash, and what Bitcoin does is it allows us to keep those same attributes in our, in our digital money. So it's not like new crazy features are being invented. They're the same features you have with paper cash. Now the reason uh, Mark Carney and, and central bankers and regulators fear that is because it makes their efforts um, 
to reduce cash uh, a little bit irrelevant because now if they reduce cash, like they want to steer everyone to the cashless uh, utopia um, and say how great that is, um, <clears throat> they can no longer do that now because uh, there's, there's a digital cash that gives us the same properties as paper cash would have. So they cannot uh, strangle us and reduce the paper cash in our life. A lot of uh, cryptocurrency exchanges are experiencing difficulty in interacting with traditional financial institutions. Um, simple things like getting bank accounts or whatever. Is there a way for both the sort of traditional and the cryptocurrency or the digital market to sort of work together in a sort of a parallel universe? Uh, well, they already are. I mean, most digital currency exchanges now are treated as banks uh, for the most part from a regulatory point of view. They, they have to conform with the same KYC and the AML guidelines. Uh, in fact, in some cases, a digital currency is more difficult to open an account with than, than a traditional bank. So there, there are um, small to mid-sized banks that are willing to work with uh, Bitcoin and Bitcoin exchanges. Um, <clears throat> and, and I think there should be more. I don't see it as a, as a detriment to growth, though, because there will always be a, a vibrant uh, cash market for Bitcoin, such as through localbitcoins.com. You can also have exchanges that don't deal in banking at all, so crypto to crypto exchanges. Um, but the opportunity is really uh, one for the, the government to uh, miss out on. Um, what happens when they uh, discourage banks from working in the Bitcoin world is they tend to push uh, Bitcoin transactions underground. Um, and they don't really want that, but that's an adverse consequence of their policy. So Bitcoin's not going away. It's just that uh, it, it may, uh, unfortunately, uh, tend to be pushed underground in some areas where they would rather keep that above ground. And the way to do that is by embracing it within the traditional financial system. The industry doesn't suffer from this problem because we don't have enough financial uh, technicians coming from mainstream banks. We've seen how far Bitcoin's come since 2009. Um, where do you see it going, let's see, where do you see it in 10 years time? Uh, it, it, Bitcoin will still be on the radar. We'll be talking about uh, central banks holding uh, Bitcoin uh, current digital currency as part of their uh, asset portfolio, uh, the way that they hold gold. Um, we'll see a mad scramble on the part of uh, countries, uh, country treasuries and central banks for acquiring uh, Bitcoin. There's only 21 million Bitcoin that will ever be in existence, so that's not even enough for every person in Spain to have one. But they can be divided into like 100 million pieces, each exactly. one, can't they? I mean, that, that's, that's what will happen. There's eight decimal spaces uh, to the right of the decimal point. So you can subdivide Bitcoin uh, uh, to get to those further levels, which is the exact opposite of what a currency like Zimbabwe uh, did, where they add zeros to the uh, left of the decimal point. Bitcoin adds zeros to the right of the decimal point, and they become more valuable. One of the other challenges of Bitcoin mining is the amount of electricity that it uses. Um, I read somewhere that a small town in New York had banned Bitcoin mining, and uh, the IMF has warned about the amount of um, electricity the blockchain uses. Uses. So, you know, how can how can the cryptocurrency world overcome that challenge? Okay, well, this is just silly on banning uh, Bitcoin mining. For, first of all, it doesn't matter who mines your Bitcoin. Um, it's permissionless activity and it's a commodity activity. So it doesn't matter that uh, uh, most of it may be done in, in China or Sweden. That worrying about that would be like worrying about uh, where your petrol is, is refined and processed for your automobile. All you want it to do is run your automobile. You don't care where it was uh, refined. Um, <clears throat> and then for the consumption side of it, uh, yeah, it, uh, you know, it is unfortunate that it takes the electricity of what we use to power Denmark. Uh, to maintain the centralized P2P uh, uh, Bitcoin network, but it's the most uh, powerful uh, decentralized distributed computer network on the planet now. And it has to be that uh, resilient in order to survive attacks uh, from various governments and from various hackers. If, uh, if, if governments and, and uh, state actors wanted Bitcoin uh, 
uh, you know, Bitcoin would already be gone by now if it wasn't resilient because they would have wanted it to be dead in 2010, 2011. Um, but the fact that it survives is because it has that resiliency. It encourages more honest uh, uh, participation in the network than dishonest participation. So when, when we see all that money being spent on mining, um, uh, yes, it's sustainable because we'll be getting more efficient. We're starting to see uh, surplus energy be used. Uh, miners are locating next to hydroelectric dams. We could see them in the future being located next to nuclear power facilities. Uh, but it all reminds me of that MasterCard ad. <clears throat> when you see, you know, uh, decentralized, resilient money, not influenced by government, uh, priceless. Um, that's the way I look at it. Many of us in Gibraltar have only started talking about Bitcoins in the last three or four years or so, but of course you were here back in 2010 talking about Bitcoins. Can you just tell us about what people thought about it back then and how you've seen the space grow and develop in Gibraltar since then? Well, it's interesting. The first uh, presentation I did was on Bitcoin as a digital casino chip uh, uh, when Bitcoin was approaching parity with, with the pound. Um, now, those were very exciting times, um, and the intersection with the gaming world is still fascinating because it's one of the top uh, volume uh, sectors uh, for the use of Bitcoin um, <clears throat> around the world, and that's very encouraging because we're seeing the upstart uh, online casinos starting to challenge mainstream gaming operators. We're seeing Bitcoin-only casinos, so it, it is an ideal um, uh, digital version of a casino chip, and, and that's starting to that's starting to pick up, that theme is picking up in the world. But we're also seeing with Gibraltar on the rock here, we're seeing um, uh, embracement, uh, embracing of the ICO movement, embracing of uh, blockchain companies, the ability to potentially uh, provide banking services for these companies. And I see Gibraltar transitioning from uh, you know, mainly a gaming economy to the ICO, uh, digital currency, cryptocurrency economy, and th th this will be fascinating. In, in five or ten years, it will overtake um, gaming as the, as the rock's number one industry. What are your thoughts on regulation? Because, of course, Bitcoin is decentralized, and the last thing you want is for you know, the regulators to sort of make it more and more centralized. Uh, governments will never be able to regulate peer-to-peer uh, -peer transactions between, uh, between different people. Um, because that's a private affair with, with no intermediary. Uh, what, where government regulation will be able to impact uh, the cryptocurrency world is where it touches fiat. So government regulations are not regulating Bitcoin, they're only regulating their citizens' movement of their fiat currency into and out of cryptocurrency. So it's not really Bitcoin regulation. Thank you very much, Sean, and enjoy your time on the Thank Rock. You. Thank you. Gibraltar introduced its DLT regulatory framework at the start of the year and since then the Financial Services Commission has received around 35 application forms with more in the pipeline. These are being processed with the first licence expected to be announced shortly. Okay, I think that we've demonstrated that we are leading globally. Uh, in the production of the uh, regulations that came out in, in January. We're adding to those with the token regulations that are coming out very, very shortly now. And then after that, we're looking at the crypto fund space as well. I think that we're pressing ahead with our advantage. We're looking at developing all the different areas in this field and making sure that we stay well ahead of the game. We've heard monetary economist John Matonis say how Gibraltar could have a cryptocurrency sector to rival gaming in five to ten years, and how the Gibraltar government feels it has established itself as the leading regulated jurisdiction for electronic cash and the blockchain technology that underpins it. 
Many thanks to Roz Astengo for that report. That's where we leave Viewpoint tonight. Next week, Davina Barbara will be here taking an in-depth look at the preparations for the 2019 Island Games. For now, though, from the whole team at Broadcasting House, thanks a lot for watching and good night.